Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Claudi Murgan, the host of the Spiritual Inspired Podcast, and my guest um, today is Frederick Lerman. Frederick is the founder of Nomad University and an accomplished musician. He plays the cello and the guitar. He also studied Japanese music with Koto master Shiniki Yutse and also raga singing with the great North Indian vocalist Pandit Pan Nat. For nine years, he was a senior student of the Tai Chi master Cheng Man Ching and founded several permanent schools of Tai Chi Chuan in major U.S. cities, including a special Tai Chi program at Naropa Institute. He has designed programs and taught jointly with many leading thinkers, among whom are Marilyn Ferguson, Jose Arguelas, Barbara Marks Hubbard, Barbara De Angelis, Peter Russell, Rupert Sheldrake, Terence McKenna, and Lynn Twist. Frederick is also the author of several books from which I'll mention one, The Sacred Landscape. Frederick, thank you for uh, joining me today. Thanks for having me here and helping me to get this set up in a way that I can show a lot of things to people on the screen. Here we are, 99 interviews later, <clears throat> to close the circle to, to 100. So I really want to, to thank you for making yourself available, because to me, this is a, a celebration um, to reach such uh, a rounded number. Well, uh, it is a big number, but it also has the number one in front of it. So it's a new start for everybody. Exactly. Um, I know you as a great um, storyteller. So I would like to start by asking you, do you think humanity needs a new sacred story? Uh, well, I think this, the, the only sacred story that counts is the new one. Because the old one, we can't go back to the past because uh, it, it was written in different languages and translated and translated and translated. So the, the way I would answer that question is that if you begin to relate to the universe, and you might want to spell that Y-O-U-N-I-V-E-R-S-E, -E, right? The universe. Um, then you have to essentially start with yourself and, and find your own way of certainty that you're not alone and that you're not at the effect of anything that... Uh, you don't accept. And I think that what, what would happen if you start to just work, think about that, you don't have to believe it or disbelieve it. You just test it, try it out. Uh, it gives you the sense of being connected to yourself, connected to where you are. And the, what we're going to talk about today has a great deal to do with a kind of adventure uh, with time and I'll tell you the story as we go through. And uh, I think that uh, there were so many clues in my life that forced me to give up the old sort of academic research, like I'm in a classroom and the teacher knows more than I do. And, you know, I'm just going to have to learn and, and I'm, I must be stupid because I'm here. You see, nobody is that stupid. But all you have to do is listen to the voice of the, of the world itself, of the universe itself. And if you're listening in that way, eventually you'll start to hear things. That's what happened to me. I, was, I did not know what I was hearing. And so uh, I hope that in the hour that we have, I can give you all a sense of listening. And I, I think my background as a musician was very helpful for me. And you will be able to uh, find your way from that point going forward. Yes, we'll get to that. But what do you think it will happen to us if we don't have the, the patience to create our new story, sacred story, moving forward by going within? How do you see the world from now on? Well, I think that we have the technical um, equipment to have a conversation like this through our computers. And we also have a, that means that we can actually sitting at home or at a desk somewhere, we can actually travel 
an enormous distance. And this has all happened in the last 22 years, 23 years. That, I mean, there was no Zoom before. So I was waiting for this for a long time, that we would be able to stay in one place and connect with everybody. So I think that that's really, really the thing that is happening in society and in culture. Uh, but a lot of us are holding on to the machines, which are just robots. So you have to go beyond the robot aspect of the machine and go to the consciousness of the people who created it and support them in actually refining it more and more. Yes, and some of us, I mean, some of the scientists and even the spiritual leaders of the of today, uh, the world we live in, they are saying that we have to evolve to from Homo sapiens to Homo luminous, yes. uh, which is more connecting to um, spirituality. What's your take on it? Well, there are so many uh, ancient cultures that have arrived at the same point, and they still have uh, much to teach us. Uh, so the Homo luminous is someone who is a human being, but is... Uh, feeling safe being a human being in their body in the environment of nature and the environment of the universe. Otherwise, you know, we are, we feel like very small ants with, which have no power and have no uh, insight. And the opposite is true. And it's happening faster and faster. I mean, I'm going to say a little bit about this as we go along with the, with the places that I've been and what happened in those places that make me speak like this, because I was just as surprised as you will be when this begins to happen to you. I, uh, yeah. I, it took me a long time to begin to trust it, but I do trust it now. Indeed. So let's start on that journey with the first place where you um, started listening or hearing things which you're not sure what you're hearing. Well, there's, I'm going to make this a very short introduction. Uh, I grew up in New York City. I'm New York City. I lived there until I was 28, 29 years old. Uh, and now I'm talking to you from uh, right outside of Seattle, Washington, which is the furthest point in the United States away from New York. <laughs> uh, for me, I mean, the West Coast is about as far as I could go unless I go to Hawaii. And uh, it wasn't that I was trying to get away from New York. It was trying to listen to what I heard one day while walking down Madison Avenue, going from the Metropolitan Museum of Art back to my parents' apartment. And I, I was walking this, you know, it would have taken about half an hour to get there. And I walked by a window uh, on the street, which uh, was a new antique store. I hadn't seen it before. And I knew that it was very close to where I went to high school. So I knew that this was a new place. And I looked in the window and I bears and dressers and tables and all kinds of furniture and a few paintings and a few uh, pottery shapes. So it was an antique store. And I said, hmm, well, this is new, but uh, you know, none of this is what I, I need or want. So I continue walking. I got to the end of this window, and you know, there was about nine feet across the window. I got to the end of it and something stopped me right there as if I had run into a wall, an invisible wall. And I never had that happen before. And I said, what is going on? Maybe there was something that I didn't notice in this window. So I came back and I looked again, and it still did not look like anything that was significant to me. So I turned and I walked again and I got stopped again. So I came back and I said, okay, what's going on? So what happened was there was a painting in the window that uh, was very small. It was in a frame that made me know that it was painted sometime around 1900 from the style of the frame. But I didn't understand what the picture was. It looked like a, a, an abstract painting. The top of the, of the picture was very small. It was about eight, eight inches across and five inches high. The top of the picture was a dark blue. The bottom of the picture was black. In the middle was what looked like a big orange ball of ice cream. 
That's what I saw. And I said, I don't know why this picture is keeping me in front of this window, but I better go in and find out what, what's going on with this picture because it doesn't fit with the rest of everything that's in the, in the window. Anyway, it turns out that, that the owner of the store came forward and he asked me if there was something he could help me with. And I said, yes, I'm curious about this picture. And I pointed to the back of the picture from inside the store. And he said, oh, that's, that's uh, by an artist who uh, went up and down the west coast of, uh, of America after the gold rush. And he went all the way up to uh, Alaska and he painted, uh, you know, glaciers and, you know, the, the type of thing that you would see in Alaska. And uh, I said, but this is not a painting of anything that looks like the landscape. It's just colors. And he said, no, no, it's a landscape. And I said, well, what is it? He said, well, the title of the painting is Mount Rainier at Sunrise. Mm -hmm. And I said, Mount Rainier, I've heard of Mount Rainier somewhere. Hmm. But where is Mount Rainier? And then it turns out that Mount Rainier was the, what I had originally interpreted as ice cream, uh, yellow, orange ice cream in the middle of, of a dark blue and black. And I it sort of suddenly changed. And I saw that it was the Eastern sunrise coming all the way across the continent. And the mountain was so big that based on everything around it, it was the first thing to have the sunlight give it that color. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole thing was completely different from what I had at, at first made it. So I said, well, this is, this, this is a very different thing now. Um, and uh, I said, uh, how much is the painting? And he said, it's $7,000. And I said, hmm. I don't even know if I have any space on a wall in my little apartment in Greenwich Village, but let me think about it overnight and I'll, I'll decide what to do. Because I was stopped by this picture and I, therefore I thought I had to take care of it. I had to save it from this antique store. Uh, it turns out that I decided not to buy it, but I said, where is Mount Rainier? And he said, oh, it's out. I think it's in Oregon somewhere. That's what he told me. Now, here I am in Seattle and Oregon. The state line is just about a two-hour drive south. So I said, okay, well, if I get to Oregon, I'll go look for this Mount Rainier. The next thing that happened was I was given a tour of the town by someone who was uh, organizing the seminar that I was going to be teaching, which was not about mountains or anything. It was about money and handling your money in a conscious way and not getting uh, anxiety interfering with the way you were relating to money in, in your life. So you could interfere with your life a lot if you worry, but if you don't worry, it seems to work out just as well. And so on the way back from this drive around the city, someone in the seminar had offered to give me a tour. Uh, we were coming across a bridge in Lake Washington, which is a big lake, was clearly visible on the left side of the bridge. But I saw that soon we were going to go behind a rather large hill, which was part of the city. So I was looking down along the lake. And at the very far end of the lake, I saw a very strange cloud in the sky. And there were no other clouds anywhere in the sky that day. It was just pure blue. And I said to, the, to uh, my she was sitting next to me and telling me where to turn. I was driving my own car. And I said, what, what is that thing down at the bottom of the lake? And she said, what thing? And I said, look, look past the, the hill. You'll see it. It's going to disappear in a moment because we're driving and we're not going to be able to see it anymore. And she said, I, I don't see anything. I said, well, do you see that white thing, that cloud down there? She said, that's not a cloud. I said, well, what is it? She said, it's Mount Rainier. You see, I didn't recognize it the first time in the city, and I didn't recognize it the first time I saw it. It seemed like something else. And I said, Mount Rainier, what's it doing here? I thought it was in Oregon. And she said, well, you remember we went by the, the Rainier Bank, Rainier Tower, the Rainier Brewery, 
Rainier Avenue. It's here, it's not in Oregon. So that was my introduction to Mount Rainier. It took me about uh, six months to be able to you know, go down there and explore it directly. And when I got to the mountain, I immediately felt the moment we went past the, the gate of the, it's a national park, and so you have to buy your way in there. The moment we went past that and paid our fee, we went into a very, very primeval forest. It was like going back thousands of years. Very big trees, very quiet, and uh, with a lot, of, a lot of energy there. So I was beginning to feel really, really good. And I had a friend with me and she was beginning to feel really, really bad. And I said, well, are you okay? And she said, well, I'm feeling kind of uh, anxious and busy and I don't know what this is. I mean, I'm okay, but I, I'm gonna keep my eyes closed. And I said, okay, well, if you are uncomfortable, we can stop the car and walk around. So in the end, it turned out that when we got up to the high part of the mountain, the highest part that the road took us, um, there was a visitor's place there and I was gonna go in and buy some film to take pictures. But the moment I step, stepped out of the car, a voice, but a voice of many people speaking in unison started talking to me and I had never experienced anything at all like that in any situation. And so I said, uh, okay, who are you? And they said, we're just here to tell you what to do. And I said, well, what about my friend? She's very uncomfortable. I said, she'll be all right. She's uncomfortable because she is a woman and this is a masculine mountain. If it was a, a, on a mountain that was a feminine mountain, you would be the one who would feel uncomfortable. But you're feeling grounded because it's, something that you can understand. And she, she recognizes herself as a female and she uh, doesn't know what to do with this energy. Anyway, that was the beginning of uh, the first encounter with the mountain close up. But did you ask them what, they, what type of spirits they were? I mean, indigenous spirits, well, I, spirits of the forest? Said, yes, I, I, mean, I said, what should I do? They said, get back in the car and continue driving on the road. Do not go to the visitor center. We're going to show you what's really going on here. And so uh, they said, when the road makes a sharp U-turn, watch on your right side of the car, and you'll see a place where there's five trees evenly spaced on the side of the road. Pull in there, and then we'll tell you what to do next. So that wasn't very far. It took about three minutes to get there. But there were no other cars there. And so I'm leaving a lot of stuff out, but I was told by this committee of voices to get out of the car and walk past the trees and walk into the meadow behind which was this very, very impressive view of the mountain. So I said, okay. And I left my friend in the car and I walked through into the grass, the high grass, almost chest height. And I just kept walking it towards the center of this big field to see a place where maybe I could sit down or mountain out just walking. And sure enough, after I'd gone about a hundred yards, there was hidden behind the high grass, a rock in the middle of the field, a fairly big rock. And as I came over the grass, I looked at it and this rock was a, just a natural rock that it had exactly the same pro. It was like a, a, a microcosm of exactly what I was looking at. Didn't have snow on top of it, but the shape was there. So I sat down on the rock and I looked at the mountain and then this, the voices started to very clearly give me a lecture. And the short version of it, they said, at this time in history, people do are, are losing their touch, my, or their awareness of nature. And, and so it is a very important thing now. And then just the, the first uh, uh, Earth Day, which is now a, a, an annual celebration on a weekend, um, had just happened. And, and very few people knew about it, but the people who knew about it got together and, and you know, honored the Earth. 
So, uh, and they said, it's very important that this information get spread around because if people do not wake up and stop taking things from the nature instead of using what nature gives you, uh, well, you're not gonna be on this planet very much longer. I said, okay, well, uh, I do give seminars, I can talk about this. They said, no, no, this is gonna take a little while. You need to tell them a very, in a very clear way that they can understand just what we said to you. I said, all right, I'll, I'll try, but I think you've got the wrong guy. I'm a musician. I don't know anything about earth magic. And they said, don't worry about it. You know, we wouldn't have interrupted you if you couldn't get this job done. So what happened with the job was it turned out to be uh, a book. And the book is a, is a long story in itself, but I'm gonna show you the cover of the book. See if you can see this here. Yes, you can see, yep. All right, I'm trying to reverse it here so it works on the field. Yeah, to your right a little bit and don't move it, yeah. All right, well, I want, can you see the whole picture? Yes, yeah. Uluru. Okay, yeah. That, that big red yeah. rock is the oldest, continuously honored natural landscape element on the planet. It's, it's the, it was the re remains of a tall mountain which over thousands of years degraded and it's just a giant sandstone thing which is about a mile long and to walk around it takes about two and a half hours. And it's in the middle of Australia, the very close to the center of Australia, which is just a desert. No, no towns very close to this place. And the Aboriginal cultures, of, uh, which are, have been around for 40,000 years in Australia, still use this as a pilgrimage spot. And they all go there you know, as many times as they can in their lifetime. So I said, well, this is very interesting. I, I wasn't expecting to find this. And so I, I was told this is the oldest living structure that you will find. And um, I had not yet understood at all what I was supposed to do with this information. But after that first experience and something that happened that evening with the place in, in the house where I was staying as a guest, uh, where I, I was able to stay up all night and watch the sun rise on this red rock. Uh, the woman who was living there, who I did not know, she was a park ranger. Um, she said to me that uh, she had had a very strange experience while, while sleeping. She had been and flown to England to Stonehenge. And, and she understood when she came back from that experience, how those stones had been brought in from 400 miles away down the rivers and put in that pattern. And uh, so after that, she stopped being a park ranger and she started being a, a, an earth explorer. So this was something that I said, well, you know, there is a reason for these things. I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna do my best to follow this through. Um, I will show you also, the, the book has a kind, it's called The Sacred Landscape, but it has, it has a uh, system to it. In the middle of the book is a picture. Is that on the screen enough? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> That's Mount Rainier. So that was the thing I thought was the ice cream. But this is in the daylight and it's white because there's snow. But in the morning, it was yellow. So it looked like mango flavored ice cream. Um, and as people read this book, I know the book came out in 1988. It took 10 years to write. And then it was published and kept in print for almost 20 years. Uh, a lot of people bought the book and, and 
got the message because I did not write 90% of what is in this book. I, I used other people's writing and then I would make comments if they had, you know, if there was space for it around each of the different sites that were set up as a kind of a, kind of a walkabout, as they say in, in Australia, that's in the Aboriginal world. They, they, they do this as a sort of basic practice. They just get up if they feel the urge and they take a walk and the walk could be for two years around Australia or it could be for 20 minutes. But they come back with insights because they have the ability to hear these things, same things that I was so surprised to hear. Um, when the book was finally finished, I'll show you one other thing. See this, Ayers Rock, or Uluru it's called, is the oldest of these big landscape uh, sort of altars. And the, the, you imagine a huge mountain range degrading down to this single rock. And this represents the oldest tradition that we have on the planet in terms of uh, consciousness of the planet itself. And on the back cover here, there's another picture which was given to me by the photographer. The, the yeah, that, that's good. That's good. <clears throat> okay. Good. That's Mount Shasta. That's in California. All right. And an equally powerful mountain, except this is a female mountain, and Ayers Rock is a male mountain, mm -hmm. according to this biology of landscape. And the reason that I put Ayers Rock on the cover is because it's the oldest one of the, anything that we know of that is still actively uh, act actively uh, understood and loved and meaningful to the oldest race that we have living on the, piano, on the planet, the uh, Australian Aboriginal culture. Um, I was told by, when I went to Mount Shasta, I was told in no uncertain terms, this is a mountain of the future. We're not there yet. So I put that on the back of the book. So you're starting at the oldest and you're going to the one that will be the newest. Uh, there's a, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to say, well, this just, you know, it's something that you made up. Uh, I didn't make it up. I, did, I rejected it also thinking, well, I don't know if that's real. But then over time, it became more and more clear that it was real. Too, there were too many people who understood the same thing that I had heard. And um, so in between, there's uh, you know, all the other types of places that you could visit. I could not fit all of them in one book. And the publisher said, no, you can't put every continent in, in the book. It would be way too expensive and way too heavy a book. So we're going to cut it down to 75 pages or so. And so I had to deal with that. And I said, okay, well, if that's the way it is, then that's the way it will be. Yeah, it's a wonderful book. And um, I can tell you that I heard at least a couple of um, stories uh, about uh, Uluru and uh, how much power it contains and uh, the significance for the um, indigenous uh, people of uh, Australia. Because I interviewed several uh, Australians uh, over these uh, two and a half years, and uh, they all um, held a lot of uh, respect, uh, not only for the location, but for uh, those who are maintaining the um, uh, um, the stories and the tradition of, of the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I thought when the book was over, I said, OK, well, finally, it's over. I had the first copy in my hands. And I was saying, well, now I can go back to my own, my, my own stuff, you know, the music that I was doing or, or teaching about different things. And so I opened my computer, the same computer that I'm looking at right now. And, and uh, I had a white screen in front of me because I was going to write something. I didn't know what I was going to write. I thought, well, should I write a letter to someone or should I start a new chapter for one of these future books? And uh, I didn't know. So I started typing and my fingers sort of did this. And it, a sentence came out on this white screen. It said, the earth is where we live. 
And I said, yes, I know that. I've been playing around with that thing for nine years now. So what is, why do I, why do I have this in front of me? And so as soon as the moment I, when I asked that question, the entire committee, again, I call them the committee, the voices on Mount Rainier, I hadn't heard from them for nine years. But as soon as I said, what is this about? And they just came on as right as if they were still sitting there. And they said, it's the first line of the children's book. The job isn't done until you tell the children. So the children's book looks like this. Right? It's a very different kind of way of putting this together for kids. Nice. Yeah. And I won't, I won't explain it all, but I had a great time writing the book because it was it only took two days to write it. It took about six months to get all the artwork done. But it, it, it was only printed for one printing round because children's books, unless they're very big sellers, do not get reprinted. And so eventually I'm going to have to reissue that book too. Um, but again, the... I'll tell you one quick story about this. Uh, I've had been used to flying around a lot all, all, all over Europe and into Australia and uh, many other areas. And um, the, oh yes, there, there, there was a flight attendant on SAS, the Scandinavian Air Service. That's the airline of Scandinavia, of, of Sweden. And uh, so she was a flight attendant and she had the flight from Stockholm to Seattle and back twice a month. So uh, when she came over, she called me and she said, I'm, I'm here. And I said, where's here? And she said, here in Seattle. I said, really, what are you doing here? She said, well, it's my new uh, assignment for a couple of months. So I gave her a copy of the book because she had two daughters. One of them was, three and the other one I think was four and a half or five and um, I said well take these take this book back to your kids and see what they have to say about it they're going to be the first reviewers of my book and uh, so when she got back she called me up the second day and she said I have to tell you what happened she said I, I showed them the book they got very excited about it they don't speak English at all yet they will know how to speak English by the time they're seven or eight, because in school there, everyone learns English pretty early. And she said, uh, so they wanted to hear the book. And so I translated it at sight, page by page, from Swedish to, um, from English to Swedish. And I just went for about three pages and I showed them the pictures and I said, okay, now you gotta go to bed. And they said, oh, no, 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 keep reading, keep reading. So she said, get in bed and I'll keep reading. So they got in their little beds in their room and she kept reading to them very slowly. And then she stopped because she couldn't hear anything. She figured they fell asleep because it was totally silent. And she wasn't looking at them because she was holding the book under the light on, on a side table. And so suddenly they both came in speaking Swedish. No, no, don't stop, keep going, keep going. So they made her read the whole book before they would go to sleep. In the morning, they said, can we take this book into school and show our teacher in the class? So she, they took it in and the teacher translated it into Swedish again for the class. So I said, that is the best review I could ever want. Yes, indeed. Amazing compliment. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I knew that's over. It's done. You know, now what's next? Now, what's next was I began to uh, get very curious about Mount Rainier. I went up there and had many strange experiences with, with very interesting groups of people. And um, we went to Mount Shasta and so on. And, but the next place that I ended up leading a tour to, estimated by distance, was Peru, going to see Machu Picchu and some of the other very ancient things in Peru. And uh, when I got to uh, the, see the Machu Picchu is, is at the end of a, of a river valley 
and it's high up on a it's not a mountain, but it's a it's a very tall hill, surrounded by other very tall hills. And so we had a group of about seventy people, and uh, we went up late in the day. Uh, we had to take a train to get there, and the hotel was not part of the ruins of Machu Picchu. It was around on the other side of another hill, so you couldn't really see it. When we arrived at night, we just went into the hotel and rested. And then in the morning, we were given instructions on how to get into the ruins. And as we went, it was very clear that, you know, we went, came around the mountain and then there was this wide opening and we could see all these buildings on, uh, on the far end of the very large field. So I was at the back of the group. I just said, when you get there, my suggestion is do not talk for the first two hours. Just go and look. And you don't have to go in groups. And then we'll meet by that tree, which is in the middle of that field when, when it's time to talk about what's going on. So they all went ahead and I was going to go follow them. But suddenly I noticed to the left a stone stairway, which was as ancient as the other ruins which was going very steeply up the mountain to the left. So I said, well, I have to go do this uh, later. But then my body turned and took me up the steps. They couldn't resist it. It was just like being stuck in front of that window and I had to turn back. So I couldn't follow the group. I went up to the top. And then I realized when I got to the top that that was the actual official ancient way of entering the city of Machu Picchu. Was a it wasn't a city, it wasn't a town, it was a, you know, a holy place. There were people who were involved in, in uh, meditation and, and in understanding nature and in learning things. So that was the first time that I just got an instruction without having any idea why I was doing this. And as I climbed up these stairs, when I got to the top, I saw the pathway coming over the mountains, which would take you into the village in the traditional way. You cross a mountain range and then you come down into the village and with all these amazing hills and other buildings down there. So I said, hmm, okay, I'll have to tell everybody that they should come up this way tomorrow and go down that way into the town and see what that feels like. Uh, now, Machu Picchu, the word means young man mountain like macho, right? It's, it's just, it just happens to be uh, in, in the language of the Incas. So Machu Picchu was the mountain behind me when I got up to the top of the stairwell. And then across the, from the far side of the city was another mountain, which is the one that is famous in all the pictures. And I'll show you the picture here as long as it's in the book. There we go. This is what you see when you start in the right place at the top of the hill, looking down. Yes, yeah. And the background is taller than all the other ones, and it's called Huaynu Pichu. Huaynu Pichu means woman's, the old woman's mountain. The Machu Picchu was young man's mountain, and Huaynu Pichu was old woman's mountain. And so I, I asked the guides there, all of whom looked like they were ancient Inca people that were protecting this place. They all spoke English because you know they had so many tourists, but the, they had stories to tell. So I said, are we allowed to go up on top of the mountain over there? And they said, yes, yes, they can. And I said, how do we get up there? It, doesn't, it looks unclimbable. They said, yes, it looks that way, but if you know the trail, you can follow it up. And I, they said, the only thing and the only rule is you have to have a woman lead the group up to the top of the mountain because it's a woman's mountain. And I said, well, should men not go? And they, they said, no, no, it's all right if a man goes, just have the woman in front of the men. So when we got up to the top of the mountain, the trail ended, but there was still more mountain. And so there was a hole in the mountain at the end of the trail and there was no sign and no guidance, but if you stuck your head in the hole, 
you could see light at the end of, it, of a tunnel which went up. So we all had to go and crawl our way up through this narrowing tunnel. And it was like being born again, only going up instead of down. That's what everybody felt. You know, and so that's why it was, and, and it was a natural cave. It hadn't been mm. built by anyone, but it had been there for thousands of years. So like a birth canal. Yeah, it was a birth canal going up. So when we came up out of there, and now we could look down and see in all directions and understand the nature of the city in a different way, and so on. So this type of travel, where you don't come with pre-expectations, uh, uh, is is very very rewarding because you know there is no guidebook that tells you about that little last step getting up the mountain and then coming down you have to come down the back of the mountain and wrap around it and come down again. So the the Machu Picchu experience is just as powerful as the Mount Rainier experience in its own way. And I began to find that there are in every continent places that are like uh, lighthouses, you know, guiding you to a certain spot. So over the years, I, uh, I went through England and Greece and Egypt was, was very powerful, uh, as one would expect. Uh, and every place was different, but every place there was a sense of connection with the earth. And some of these things were very subtle. Sometimes a hill, a small hill, would be a very strong attractor. So in England, when we went to Glastonbury, which was supposedly where King Arthur and his, his uh, wife were buried, this is not necessarily true, but I did see the, the grave site. And the only thing about it that was strange was that King Arthur's tomb, uh, you know, his, his space in the ground was very long. He was a very big man, apparently, if that was true. In any case, it was, it was uh, a sacred site for the Druids and for many of the different, every, every place will have a different language for what it is that they have learned. But it's more and more now coming together because, as you see, in terms of the, uh, the weather and what's happening now with climate change or whatever that is, really, um, we have to adapt in a way which is going to be very challenging. Perhaps. We'll see. I mean, you know, you don't want to. Uh, except you don't want to plan on having a problem, but the problem could happen and there is a solution and the, uh, the, so this, those guys down in Australia know the answer to the question of what's the solution. Yes, and, and I'm glad that you had this um, type of experience where these um, entities, these spirits, you know, knocked on your door and told you what to do. Uh, very few of us, I think, get this type of uh, message and uh, get the, the guidance, the necessary guidance to, to achieve certain uh, goals in life, either for um, ourselves or for humanity. And mainly, uh, most of the time is for humanity, because uh, indirectly when humanity is doing better, uh, we are doing better ourselves, because as you mentioned, we are all uh, yeah. one. So I, I'm glad and thank you for, for sharing all these um, experiences with, with us because, as you said, um, the tour guide <clears throat> or the, the booklet will tell you about the uh, touristic objectives, but they cannot mention what type of experience one will get while traveling or visiting these uh, sacred sites. I just want to add one thing because I know we're coming to the end of the time that uh, is recent very recent experience, which is that about a month and a half ago, maybe a little longer, I was just sitting down somewhere doing something and suddenly the thought came through my mind that uh, I had never heard this idea before. It says, time does not move. We move, but time does not move. That's a very profound idea. 
Can you please repeat the second part because you broke away a little bit. Time does not move and then... Time does not move. We move through time, but time does not move. So the past is still there. Everything that has happened in the past is still happening in the past. And you can, in various ways, go back and experience those things that you actually did or felt in, in the past, in your past. And the past is... Everybody who's ever lived has access to their own past, even if they have died and been reborn several times. And this is a kind of a common um, belief in shamanism, that if you are aware of uh, who you actually are, not, not who you're supposed to be or not who people tell you you are, uh, you'll begin to be able to access information from the past and the future is unknown, but it's completely, it contains every possibility. So you're, we're standing in time which doesn't move, but once we've moved out of our own past into the present, the future is also available. I mean, we don't know what it is until we discover it. And by discovering the future, we create it. So I, I had this thought and I said, well, this is kind of strange. But within the next month and a half, I saw many other statements of the same idea, which I had never seen before in people's books and people talking, lecturing on things, physicists, doctors, and so on. So I'm pretty, pretty sold on this idea that time itself is permanent. And so this idea of the homo luminous, where, where a person uh, is not trapped in their body and the body getting older and then the body dies and that's the end it's really a, more like like uh, you know reading one of these books and then realizing that a whole new reality is available to you and it doesn't yeah. matter whether 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 you're here or not you will continue to be in all aspects of time both the past the present in the future yes and i can complete uh, or i can add that uh, something else i've uh, read uh, recently is that when we break free from time we also break free from the specter of death right. so in my opinion this is the basis of all world's religions um, but each of them interprets it in, in a different way uh, am i correct yeah i mean there's a lot more to tell and, and Claudio, I'll just mention this to you because the first time when we went to Machu Picchu, before we went to Machu Picchu, we went to the town of Cusco, which is very high up in the mountains, but it's where the train goes to Machu Picchu, which was only discovered in 1918, I think. It was lost back there in the hills. And uh, so we all went out uh, to a restaurant which had some um, Peruvian music and there was a band playing and they were very, very excellent musicians and, you know, wonderful, unusual music, which we very much enjoyed. And there was one other group of tourists there or another group of people who were also, they had just come back from Machu Picchu. They were a couple of weeks ahead of us. And that was Alberto Villoldo's group. We happen to just go to the same restaurant at the same time. Interesting. <clears throat> yes, and for those who don't know, um, he's a known shaman, author. Um, he's married with uh, with a shaman woman also. Uh, and they do um, hold uh, courses and uh, take tours to, to Peru and other um, sacred sites in South America. Yes. Yeah, and, and what he said about Homo Luminous is exactly the same idea as in different terms of my thought of that we, that time doesn't move, we move through it. Yes, beautiful. Um, Frederick, what is the, the future of Nomad University? How do you see the university uh -huh. evolving? All right, well, a long time ago in 1974, I was teaching at a new school in um, Colorado that was started by a, a Tibetan Lama. It's called Naropa Institute. And it's still still going there. 
But I, I started teaching there because I thought, now this is a whole new idea in education. The faculty is very interesting people. Um, perhaps this would be a better way to deliver education than what I had experienced. And uh, it turns out that there was a lot of um, disagreement between the administration and the teachers. And so I said, that that's, that's just a, the opposite of what should be happening. Everybody should be uh, creating together. And uh, so I decided, well, Naropa Institute is not going to work for what I have in mind. So I woke up the next morning with a whole idea complete in my head. And it was called Nomad, Inst Nomad University, the college of your choice. Right? And then I could talk about this all day. Uh, we tested it for about 20 years in different forms around the world. And it was always a success. People were very excited about it. And then I said, now there's going to be a change. Pretty soon we're going to have things like Zoom. I mean, this was all before the internet, these experiments with trying out different ways of, of teaching. And uh, the students loved it, the faculty loved it. And the, the one thing I'll tell you about it is that where it says the college of your choice, which was what I, the slogan, Nomad University, the college of your choice. It's because you get to choose everything as a student. You grade the teachers, they do not grade you. So the teachers have to be really interesting in order to survive without being thrown out by the students. The teachers who were daring to do that were very confident that they could contribute something very And so it developed very well. And uh, we practiced it in cities around the world in different ways. And then I stopped it in 1993. I said, let's wait for Zoom, et cetera, to come and then we'll start it over again. And it will save everybody money because you wouldn't have to travel so far all the time. And, you know, you can still come and create the classes and find the teachers. So that's what's going on. And there's, there's a lot more to say about it. So I have to write another book about that. So in other words, you are adapting the, the business model and the educational model to the new um, technological advancements and um, right. requirements. Yeah, because not to do it is, is to, you know, <clears throat> it's, it's going to take too much time. And we don't have that much time. We want to really get people awake as quickly as possible. Yeah. Frederick, we are approaching the end of the, the interview. Any final thoughts? Well, uh, I hope that I didn't give too long a story in any of the things that I wanted you to, to know. But um, I, I'm working on a book that will come out whenever it's done. Several chapters will have been written over the years, and it's called Wisdom Walk. Mm. In other words, the, what I learned, I learned by traveling and going to these places and interacting with people that I didn't know existed. And, uh, and so after a while, I came to trust and understand and be able to actually explain to people to some extent that there's a lot more to it than what we were taught in previous generations. So the, the earth is, you know, waiting for us to, uh, to catch up and, and start to uh, behave in a way that works for everybody. So in other words, <clears throat> listen to your inner voice, um, trust yourself, move mm -hmm. forward as much as possible, um, mm -hmm. learn from your own mistakes and uh, gather the wisdom. That's right. And, you know, and uh, I, it's my, my prediction is that the major universities of the world, some of them will continue, but most of them will disappear because they're, they're simply teaching uh, people how to become in a larger model of a, of a big machine called society. Yeah, and I think they, they learn, they, they teach... Uh less uh, knowledge and more, uh, you know, um, political behavior and uh, all kinds of... Uh... Right, and you know, I mean, and then, and then there you have rituals of family and of, of professions and so on. 
And the people that are right now, in, I mean, here we had COVID and all kinds of things that made no sense at all. And uh, there are more and more people who are waking up and saying, we know that there's something wrong with this, but how is what, what is going to happen and how can we uh, not fall for the propaganda that is telling us that if we get this vaccine, we're going to be healthy? Yes. You know? All these systems has uh, need a reset, uh, you know, the, the medical, educational, legal, governmental, all those uh, require the, the reset and it's going to happen, hopefully. And I'm sure that on our terms, not on other people's terms, uh, and we will uh, be victorious at the end of, uh, of the tunnel. So once right. again, it's been a pleasure and an honor to, to have you for episode number 100. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Claudio. And to everybody, hope I meet any of you that happen to run into me anywhere. <laughs> thank you. And uh, to my viewers, thank you for um, watching, share it, like it, uh, get a free copy of my book when uh, you visit my website. And until next time, love and gratitude.